Well, it's an honor and privilege to be here uh, at Southwestern Seminary, and uh, our family is so thrilled uh, that God has brought us here at this moment and to join the amazing work here. We're grateful for the leadership of uh, Dr. Greenway and Dr. Dockery and the faculty here, what God is doing here, and uh, love just walking the, uh, the campus, the beautiful campus, and excited to see what God will do through uh, the Land Center and through uh, our work uh, at Texas Baptist College. So we're delighted to be here, and thank you for the warm welcome. Uh, we're speaking this morning from Acts chapter 12, so if you have your Bible, I'm going to encourage you to turn there. Uh, the title of my message today is The Church on the Move, uh, and uh, we're going to read from Acts chapter 12, and I don't normally read this long of a passage, but I'm going to read the entire passage, so if you'll follow along with me, Acts chapter 12. About that time, King Herod violently attacked some who belonged to the church, and he executed James, John's brother, with the sword. When he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter, too, during the festival of unleavened bread. After the arrest, he put him in prison and assigned four squads of four soldiers each to guard him, intending to bring him out to the people after the Passover. So Peter was kept in prison, but the church was praying fervently to God for him. When Herod was about to bring him out for trial that very night, Peter, bound with two chains, was sleeping between two soldiers, while the sentries in front of the door guarded the prison. Suddenly, an angel of the Lord appeared, and a light shone in the cell. Striking Peter on the side, he woke him up and said, Quick, get up. And the chains fell off his wrists. Get dressed, the angel told him, and put on your sandals. And he did. Wrap your cloak around you, he told them, and follow me. So he went out and followed, and he did not know what the angel did was really happening, he, but he thought he was seeing a vision. After they passed the first and second guards, they came to the iron gate that leads into the city, which opened to them by itself. They went outside and passed one street, and suddenly the angel left him. When Peter came to himself, he said, Now I know for certain that the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me from Herod's grasp and from all that the Jewish people expected. As soon as he realized this, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John Mark, where many had assembled and were praying. He knocked at the door of the outer gate, and a servant named Rhoda came to answer. She recognized Peter's voice, and because of her joy, she did not open the gate, but ran in and announced that Peter was standing at the outer gate. You're out of your mind, they told her. But she kept insisting that it was true. And they said, it's his angel. Peter, however, kept on knocking. And when they opened the door and saw him, they were amazed. Motioning to them with his hand to be silent, he described to them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison. Tell these things to James and the brothers, he said, and he left and went to another place. At daylight, there was a great commotion among the soldiers as to what had become of Peter. After Herod had searched and did not find him, he interrogated the guards and ordered their execution. Then Herod went down from Judea to Caesarea and stayed there. Herod had been very angry with the people of Tyre and Sidon. Together they presented themselves before him. After winning over Blastus, who was in charge of the king's bedroom, they asked for peace because their country was supplied with food from the king's country. On an appointed day, dressed in royal robes and seated on the throne, Herod delivered a speech to them. The assembled people began to shout, It's the voice of a god and not of a man. At once an angel of the Lord struck him because he did not give the glory to God, and he was eaten by worms and died. But the word of the Lord flourished and multiplied. After they had completed their relief mission, Barnabas and Saul returned to Jerusalem, taking along John, who is called Mark. Let's bow our heads and pray, shall we? Lord, we thank you for the gift of your word. Uh, we're thank you, thankful that you are a God who speaks, that we don't have to guess and wonder what you're saying to us and what you would have us to know about you and about ourselves. Lord, I pray that your spirit would fall fresh on us this morning as we open your word and learn from you. In your name we pray, amen. In December 2020, the stillness of Christmas uh, in Pemi, a small village in northeastern Nigeria, was shattered by the sounds of gunshots as Boko Haram militants attacked Christians at worship, invading homes, burning down a church, slaughtering men, women, and children, and killing the local priest. In March of 2011, a young girl named Rocky Opino opened the door of her home in Colombia, 
a door she had opened previously to share the good news of Jesus with a guerrilla fighter who accepted her gift of a Bible. The next time that door opened, Rakia was greeted by the terrorist group FARC, who shot her to death. Those believers in Nigeria and that young girl named Rakio and thousands of others whose faces and names we don't know, whose spilt blood rarely graces the headlines that scroll across our timelines, well, they're part of a long line of faithful Christians who were willing to obey and declare their faith despite persecution. And these are just two of many hundreds of stories from uh, places like Voice of the Martyrs, who, which tracks and reports persecution of Christians today around the globe and really equips Christians to pray for Christian martyrs. And this is what we see in our text today in Acts chapter 12. And the first point that I have is we see that the church is attacked here in the book of Acts. Jesus had said in Acts 1, 8, that when the Spirit came down, this new movement of God would spread from Jerusalem to Judea to the uttermost parts of the earth. And this is exactly what's happening as you read the book of Acts. And let me just stop you for a second and say that if you are a pastor or if you are someone who's even leading a small group or in any way in leadership, how important it is for us as leaders to really be familiar with the book of Acts, to read it. Uh, sometimes we get so jaded in our ministries, so consumed with the problems and difficulties that we forget that the Spirit of God, the same Spirit alive in the people of God in the first century, is alive in the 21st century. So I encourage you to preach through the book of Acts and awaken your people to what the Spirit might do among his people. In the first seven chapters of Acts, the church is gathering and growing in Jerusalem. And then in the next few chapters, say 8 through 12, the church, having experienced severe persecution in Jerusalem with the stoning of Stephen and then with the conversion of Saul uh, and, and things like that, uh, is being scattered. The church is being scattered and is reaching Samaria and Judea. And in the rest of the book of Acts, you see the gospel witness expanding to the uttermost parts of the known world, like Greece and Rome and beyond. Well, in Acts 12, the, the camera lens focuses away from the church in Antioch, part of that Judea Samaria, and the focus shifts back to Jerusalem. It's about a year later, a year after Jesus' death and resurrection. It's during the time of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, right before Passover, and the church is under attack by Herod. Luke says in verse 1 that Herod violently attacked the church and he executed James with the sword. Now, there are a lot of Herods in the Bible, and I'm sure in seminary you're learning how to distinguish between all of them, right? I hope so. <laughs> well, this Herod is the grandson of Herod the Great who committed infanticide in Jerusalem, I mean, sorry, in Bethlehem upon hearing of the birth of Jesus. The text here says that this Herod did this execution of James and arrest of Peter for political motivations. He was actually part Jewish, but he was educated in Rome. His father was murdered by his grandfather, Herod. He was raised in Judea by his uncle. When a new Caesar came to power in Rome, he was, this Herod was appointed ruler in Judea and Samaria. All he'd known his entire life was political machinations and palace intrigue. Ajith Fernando writes this. He says, there's much irony in this chapter. According to Luke, the imprisonment of Peter took place during the Feast of Unleavened Bread, that is the Passover. At the time when the Jews were celebrating the deliverance of their nation through God's intervention, a herald of God's climactic act of deliverance was taken into custody to please the Jews. While they should have been celebrating a great salvation, they were hoping to inflict a great punishment on the representative of the Savior. This move by Herod was done solely to endear himself to the ruling class in Israel, who was increasingly threatened by this Jesus movement, a movement that they thought they, they would easily stamp out. They thought they had put, put down. And the more they did that, the more it grew. But let's put ourselves, though, in, in the shoes or in the sandals, if you will, of the early church in Jerusalem. You know, it's easy for us to read this text and Acts in kind of a flat way, but think about this. James is killed. 
Peter's arrested. These are two of the top leaders in the early church. Remember, Peter, James, and John were part of Jesus' really tight inner circle. It had been hard enough for them to watch Stephen stoned to death, but now the persecution is ramping up. Herod is going after their leaders. And you see, these people gathered here, mourning the death of James, and worried about Peter, they don't have the rest of the book of Acts to see how the gospel perseveres despite persecution. They don't have the rest of the New Testament to see and read Paul's letters from jail. They don't have John's revelation to see a vision of God's coming kingdom. They don't have 2,000 years of church history to see the church triumphant through the ages. All they know is James, their beloved leader, is dead. And Peter, well, he's on death row. And imagine the horror of getting the news of James' death. His widow, his children, his family having to grieve. And now Peter's in jail, uh, facing the same fate. The only reason Peter wasn't killed is because Passover was was nigh. The text says these religious folks wanted to parade him uh, after Passover as in a defiant show of ending the Jesus movement. And yet this persecution is what Jesus promised to those who would follow him. A year earlier, Jesus had told his disciples in an upper room discourse, he said, they will hate you for my name's sake. If they hated me, they'll hate you. The servant's not greater than his master. Peter would later write to the church in his epistles, not to be surprised by fiery trials. But if you're these people in this moment, it seems like something's going wrong. Like God is caught off guard. And yet the word from Jesus to them and to us today is that we shouldn't be surprised by opposition to the gospel. We shouldn't be surprised by people hating the Christian message. We shouldn't be surprised by when the world opposes the gospel. Although, Knowing and understanding and even expecting persecution still doesn't make it easier. I think of the dear saints of our brothers and sisters in Christ right now who are in Afghanistan, who are facing the sword of the Taliban, who have a profoundly courageous faith and are saying, we're going to stay here because God has called us here. And yet, it's not easy. It does strike me that the church in the West today, we're not really prepared for persecution. We often recoil when we're opposed. We're shocked that the world would be against us. Or we, we shrink back from controversial aspects of Christian orthodoxy because we're nervous and scared about what people will think of us. Look, we shouldn't seek out persecution. We shouldn't manufacture crisis in order to be a self-made martyr, which is an easy thing to do today in this digital age. And yet we should understand that in this life, it won't always be easy to be a Christian. Which brings me to the second point, the church gathered. So we have the church attacked, and now we see the church gathered. What is the response of the church in seeing their brother James brutally beheaded and their brother Peter locked in prison? Well, they gathered and prayed. That was their first instinct, was to gather and to pray. First, they gathered. You know, the church is a gathering body and always has been. Of course, COVID has reset a lot of things, and thankfully, technology allowed us to experience some level of worship and some level of church life by gathering online. But let's not fool ourselves. We are a gathering people. We are an embodied people. We're not just souls, but we're bodies and souls. Our worship is embodied. Look, technology is helpful, and thank God for it, but it's it's no replacement for being together. We are an embodied people, and I think as we regather after COVID, we need to emphasize in our preaching and our teaching the importance of gathering together in prayer and worship and preaching. Um, There's something that forms the heart by having those weekly rituals of going to church, right? Um, Look, 
uh, a few years ago, a, a popular author said something to the effect of, man, I just don't go to church anymore. You know, I just, I'll stay home, I'll watch a, a talk, and I'll listen to some music. Um, and his whole thing was, you know, church is basically like a TED Talk with music. And I will say this, if that's all you think of church, that's going to be your attitude. Look, I have no doubt on Sunday you can find a better sermon online. And I have no doubt that on Sunday you can find a better worship to listen to. But church is so much more than that. You know, when you come every week and you gather with your small group or you, uh, you sit in that same spot and that same guy who sings off tune messes up your, your melody or whatever, or you greet that usher the same way and the donuts are stale and all that stuff, right? But all that stuff is so formative. We are a gathering embodied people. And I dare say to get up on Sunday and go to church is more than just a thing to do on Sunday. It's a statement. It's a pledge. In many ways, it's an act of war against the forces of hell. And listen, for 2,000 years, the church has gathered in cathedrals and caves, in storefronts and under elegant steeples. The church has risked her life in many places to gather. There's power in the gathered church. Jesus said, where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am in the midst of them. And for this small and persecuted body of believers in this tiny home, Jesus was there. You see, Herod may have wielded his sword. Governments may threaten, but they have zero power. They have no power against the gathered church on her knees. You see, prayer has power. Prayer storms the gates of hell. Verse 5 says they prayed fervently and earnestly. The Greek means a word that refers to being stretched. This was absolute face on the floor, begging God in desperation. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Folks, we have a lot to do in our lives besides prayer. We're to pray and watch. We're to do both. We're to pray and act. But we never, ever have anything more important to do than to get on our knees before God. As my pastor says, prayer is the work. Look, Herod was powerful. Rome was powerful. (laughs) But they were no match for God's people in prayer. And today, I want to tell you, there are forces in the world arrayed against God's people around the world. There is reason for us to be concerned and to fear. But they're no match for the power of God working through his people on their knees. Jesus would tell them in that upper room after he warned them of persecution, he would say, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. I love Luther's epic hymn, A Mighty Fortress. I love this lyric so much. The prince of darkness grim, we tremble not for him. His rage we can endure, for lo, his doom is sure. One little word shall fell him. By the way, Peter understood this. (laughs) He's in jail, and Luke says he's sleeping between... Two guards. Now let's think about this for a moment. Peter, who a year ago at this very time thought he was brave and he denied the Lord, now filled with the Spirit, he doesn't have to show how tough he is in defending Jesus. He can calmly accept his fate, arrested for preaching the gospel. Remember when Peter couldn't understand why Jesus was sleeping in the boat? How can you sleep during the storm? Here's Peter sleeping during his own storm. And remember, Peter doesn't know the rest of the story when he's in prison. He doesn't have the rest of the book of Acts. All he knows is that James, whom he spent every waking minute with for multiple years, his fellow apostle, James is dead. And Herod has every intent of doing the same thing to him. And yet he can sleep. Same reason Paul could say with confidence, for me to live is Christ, to die is gain. Look, Peter didn't sign up for jail. He didn't want Herod's sword on his neck. But he was ready to go to his death because he knew the one who conquered death. Listen, I I love, I love our freedom in America. I love the fact that we enjoy religious liberty. Man, this is a hallmark and a heritage of Baptists. And I don't want to yield it 
I spent a lot of my life fighting for it. I intend to continue to do that. But if the day comes that we're called to live under persecution, we can do it with joy. And God can be glorified. Did you realize that the fastest growing church in the world is in Iran? Where the, where the government is clamping down so hard and yet people are converting to Christianity in record numbers. So the church here prayed but couldn't believe the miracle had actually happened. When Rhoda comes to the door, she, she didn't even let Peter in. You know, he's out there, he's like, can someone let me in, you know? The hard part was done. You know, the angel rescued him. The easy part just, you know, kind of let me in here. Um, they could have used one of those, you know, sort of camera things that we have now that we see our <laughs> Amazon packages. So he's stuck outside. He's looking over his shoulder. He's wondering, you know, if Herod's thugs are going to come after him. They couldn't believe this miracle happened. And so it is with us sometimes, is it not? We're surprised by God's miracles. We're surprised by God's answer to prayer. Look, I think we can err on, on both sides of this. We can have an errant theology that says, if you have enough faith, God's always going to answer and God's always going to give you health and wealth in this life. And we know that's not true. We know that's a lie. But there's another way we can err too. Sometimes we get to a place where we don't think, we don't expect God to do anything. We don't expect any kind of blessing. And we forget that God is the good father who wants to give us good things. So we should pray with expectancy. Praying, expecting God can do what he is powerful to do. Pray for that miraculous healing of that person who's got cancer and sick. Pray for that marriage to be repaired. Pray for that prodigal to come home. Pray with expectancy, but then trust that God knows what is best. That when God doesn't give us what we want, that God is still good. I think it's funny that Peter told her to be, them to be quiet. First, I think he's trying to be inconspicuous here. But secondly, I, I think he's trying to calm them down to say, hey, like, guys, like, I know you're excited. Can I actually tell you what happened? Right? It's like when your kids are running in, you're like, just everyone calm down so we can, you know, explain what happened. But imagine the mixed emotions of the church here. They had seen the worst and the best, tragedy and miracle in the same season. James was killed, and yet Peter was spared. And we don't know the mystery of God's providence, but we do know that he gets glory whether we are rescued or whether we're called to endure. You see, he can get glory from a church hiding in caves to worship and under threat of death. And he can get glory from those of us who live free and worship in cathedrals. God can get glory when that cancer is cured and God can get glory when that loved one is taken to glory. We should remember that the same church that prayed earnestly for James also prayed for Peter, and yet God answered differently in ways we don't really understand. In this past year, I'm sure you've seen it as we've seen in our family, we've had dear friends that we prayed for earnestly who died of COVID. And we had some dear friends who got really sick with COVID and recovered miraculously. And we have to trust that God is good in each situation. The last point I have is the church triumphant. And this is the last part of the chapter, and it's a remarkable turn of events. The chapter begins with horror and tragedy and fear. One of three most important apostles is dead, and the other is in jail, about to face the sword. It looks like the church is on the run, and it looks like Herod has conquered. Herod is is, is trying to attack the leaders of the church to cut the head off the snake so he can stop the movement. But the chapter not only ends with Peter being sprung from prison, but Herod, the powerful ruler of Judea, who thought he could move and maneuver, who thought he could manipulate and control, who lusted and craved for power. Well, it ends with him going down an embarrassing defeat, his body eaten by worms. I guarantee you that's not the legacy he he planned for himself. Herod raised himself up and accepted worship and glory that was only due to God. This is a demonstration that God will not be mocked. God is jealous of his own glory, the glory due to him. And you see, Herod here, like his grandfather, was part of a long line of people who have lined themselves up against God. This is a fulfillment of the prophecy way back in the garden 
where God promised that the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent would violently clash. Oh, but the seed of the woman crushed the head of the serpent when Jesus on the cross cried, it is finished. And when he walked out of that grave three days later. So I just want to say, my friends, brothers and sisters gathered here today, some of you young people are going to be called to labor in very difficult situations, in faraway places. And I want you to hear and see from God's word that the wicked rulers of this age and of every age have an expiration date. As Jesus said in his confrontation with Pilate, you only have power because I give it to you. Herod thought he was powerful. He was gonna put down this Christian movement and use it to accumulate more power. By attacking Peter and James, he thought, man, I've got them now. And the Psalm 2 asks the question, really, it makes a statement. Why do the nations rage and the people plot in vain? The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers conspire together against the Lord and his anointed one. Let's tear off our chains and throw their ropes off of us. The one enthroned in heaven, he laughs. The Lord ridicules them. Then he speaks to them in his anger and terrifies them in his wrath. I have installed my king on Zion, my holy mountain. Listen, listen, my friends, I want you to hear this. The nations Rage and God laughs. Listen, we don't have to fear. We don't have to live in fear. I'm not saying we shouldn't fight for our freedoms as an American. We, we absolutely should as a stewardship of what God has given us as citizens of this representative republic. We should work for religious liberty for our generation and for the next. Because when we do that, we're not just working for ourselves, we're working for who? For our children. But we should not live in fear as though we are losing the battle. My friends, Herod is dead. And the church is alive. Dictators and despots have tried to crush the church for 2,000 years. And the church is triumphant. Jesus promised, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. This is the theme of the book of Acts. (laughs) <laughs> they can kill the leaders and God raises up new ones. And sometimes God raises up new ones among the people that were doing the killing. As if to say to the rulers of the world, I even got people in your own community that I'm gonna use to advance the gospel. Imagine for a moment how this passage in Acts 12 though encouraged the early church who would endure four centuries of brutal persecution from Rome. How they could read and look back and say, the church will be triumphant. Imagine how it comforts those who hide in caves and underground places today around the world. In places like China and Nigeria and Afghanistan and North Korea. Listen, God's kingdom cannot be stopped by temporary dictators. I love this word that John Piper wrote when a missionary to Libya was martyred in 2013. He says, finally, I call thousands of you to take his place. They will not kill us fast enough. Let the replacements flood the world. We do not seek death. We seek the everlasting joy of the world, including our enemies. If they kill us while we love them, well, we are in good company. Jesus did not call us to ease or safety. He called us to love for the sake of his name everywhere among all peoples. My friends, let us not sweat the times And the moment we are in, let's not fear temporary tyrants and powerful governments. Let's not wring our hands over the culture that is moving against Christianity. Let us instead embrace our moment with joy. This is how it has been for 2,000 years. And nothing can stop the movement of God through his church. It just can't. Look at the end of the chapter in these words in verse 24. (laughs) But the word of God spread and multiplied. How's that working out for you, Herod? Herod's dead and the word is alive. Listen, the church is on the move. The church is triumphant. And God's work in the world will not be stopped. Man, I just want to say, there is so much cynicism in the church today. 
There's so much cynicism among Christian leaders. Just scroll Twitter for like 30 minutes. We have convinced ourselves that God's best days are behind him. We've convinced ourselves that the spirit is on the move only in past times. We've convinced ourselves that Jesus saves, but maybe 50 years ago. But I want to tell you, God is doing a work today. The church is on the move. The church is triumphant. The church is victorious. And I want to tell you, as you go into ministry, man, preach this word with confidence, with joy, with expectation. Don't yield to the cynicism of the age. God has made us for this moment. Not a moment 50 years ago. Not a moment in 50 years. He's made us for this moment. And go into the world with joy and confidence. The same Holy Spirit who was active in his church in the first century is active in his church in the 21st century. God is not up in heaven wringing his hands about the things that cause us to wring our hands. Here's another quote from Ajith Fernando. He says, God always has the last word. If this does not seem to be the case, it's because the last word has not yet been said. I want to read a verse from Hebrews chapter 11 that's not up on the screen, but I came across in my devotional reading that I think should be a theme verse uh, for us. Actually, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 39 The writer of Hebrews says, but we are not those who draw back and are destroyed, but those who have faith and are saved. I want to close with this word from an Afghan Christian that wrote recently about their uncertain future. As an Afghan Christian, I've been in prison and exiled for following Christ and preaching his gospel. Sometimes I question God's purposes in my hardship and and in being tortured in prison, but God's grace strengthened me. The world will hate us because we follow Jesus. We need to be ready to respond to persecution. God teaches believers how to endure persecution by following the example of Jesus, trusting the promises of the Bible, and looking forward to the day when we will meet Jesus on his throne. And in every circumstance, we are not to deny our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, but to proclaim the gospel to the world. Should that not be our mission statement? If our Afghan brothers and sisters can commit to that when they're facing the sword, when their homes are being knocked down, when their daughters are being taken, we can have that same confidence and joy wherever God sends us out into the world. Would you bow your heads and pray? Heavenly Father, we're so grateful and thankful for the witness of the early church, for the beautiful story of Acts 12. And Lord, I pray that we'd be a church that would be gathered on our knees. Lord, I pray that we would not be gripped by the cynicism of the age, that we would not be so catechized by bad headlines, that we would not be so formed by the negativity around us, but that we would see your work in the world and have confidence that your spirit is at work among his people even today. Lord, I pray for every one of these young men and women who you're calling to go minister in some difficult places in the world, that you would go ahead of them and prepare the way and that through them there might be a mighty work of God. In your name we pray, amen.